Mosley, Thompson Raider, Trent. A quorum being present, we will start our meeting. The first bill we'll hear, I'm going to do executive session as soon as we get a couple more people here. Um, but for now, we'll start with Senate Bill 333 and uh, Senator Trent. Please begin when you're ready. And anybody that testifies today, please tell us who you are and make sure you fill out a witness form uh, when you testify. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Curtis Trent representing Senate District 20. Uh, Senate Bill 333 is the uh, Missouri Nuclear Clean Power Act. Uh, very simply, the goal of this bill is to uh, enable or facilitate the uh, construction of small modular reactors. Uh, the, uh, the terms of the bill is, uh, is limited to uh, power generating facilities that are rated at 200 megawatts or, uh, or more. Uh, it is, is, would, would be excluded uh, from, uh, from the provisions of the bill. Uh, again, because we're, we're looking at uh, small modular uh, reactors. Um, the, uh, the bill would re-enable the, uh, the quit process for those small modular reactors, uh, but it would also, also contain uh, clawback provisions uh, if uh, those reactors are, are uh, either not completed or not completed in a way that is uh, in the best interest of the rate payer. Uh, of course, is determined by the uh, PSC. Uh, so I've got some witnesses here today, uh, I think from both industry and uh, electrical generation uh, companies to, uh, to discuss uh, the bills from their various perspectives. Uh, but essentially the goal here is to uh, make sure that it's Missouri uh, faces increasing needs for power generation in the years ahead uh, and the restrictions on uh, coal power plants and other types of traditional power plants uh, grows increasingly constrained uh, that we are able to explore new generations of nuclear power uh, which will provide the base load necessary to have a stable grid and of course uh, a stable grid is a prerequisite for all the other uh, renewables and other alternative energy sources uh, that uh, our country is currently experimenting with, uh, wind, solar, and, and all the above. Uh, so I think it's an important uh, part of uh, our nation's energy portfolio going forward. And Missouri, there's no reason for our state not to be on the cutting edge of next generation of, of, uh, of power. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you, Senator. Um, so this is just in the acronym soup we do down here. This is repealing QIP, at least up to 200 megawatts. Is that right? Yes, for for the small modular reactor. So it doesn't touch the big big projects that that process was originally right. suspended for, um, like the the full scale nuclear plants. Okay. The, the the main concern I have, though, or that when I think about it, is just you know I think in '76 I've been told is when this was passed by a citizens' petition, and it just something about this it seems like maybe. Maybe this is a path to go, but maybe put it back on the ballot or something would be the way to do it. Uh, well, I mean, certainly if uh, the only way we could get it done would be to put it back on the ballot, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to that. I, I think that, you know, uh, it's, it has been um, 70, 76, uh, has been quite a considerable amount of time ago. <laughs> and has. I think the citizens of this state empower this body, yeah. uh, the General Assembly, to weigh these kinds of policy questions. And, uh, and so I think it's entirely appropriate to do it here as well. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the senator? Senator McCready. So uh, do you think that if this were to go on the ballot that the voters would be okay with repealing their the consumer protections? Well, it's, uh, it's going to be a completely different set of voters uh, than, than voted in 76, so I don't know that we can extrapolate. I, I voted uh, in 76. I'm well, so, so not, not completely set, not completely <laughs> different, you know. Uh, yes. in, in the way that we a river is different, but yes, the same. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I, I think, you know, I, I have received good feedback um, from, from folks as I've gone around in my district talking about this issue. Interesting, because uh, I'm, I'm feeling the opposite, and some of that is uh, what we're seeing happening in other states where the consumers have been left on the hook for bill billions with a B. So that's why, you know, I, I think part of the reason we might be having this hearing is because I don't think it would make it past the voters. 
Well, the, the this bill attempts to address that concern with with uh, you know allowing the clawbacks and also uh, by limiting it to the smaller reactors. So you're not having the 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 full scale cost of a of a full reactor. But they're certainly not bargain units. That's it's still a very expensive proposition. Uh, they are they are expensive for sure. Uh, I don't I think they would be more in line with what you would expect from a coal plant in terms of cost. Uh, it still probably would be a little bit more expensive, but not drastically okay. uh, more so. so. And, of course, coal plants are, are effectively banned in our country at this point in terms of new construction. So uh, I'm always open to other alternatives, but I do think we need base load power uh, options. And if you're excluding coal and other traditional forms of power, I don't really know where else you go to. So I, I'm glad you brought up base load because um, one, one of the things that it seems is that the, the investor-owned utilities are not in support of this bill. They might not be in opposition to it, but they're not testifying in support of that. Um, and I think some of that connects to that resource, that is it IRP, Integrated Resource Plan, that shows that we have the energy that we need moving forward. So. Well, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, especially holistically from a nationwide perspective. Uh, we may have in the short run the power that we need right now, but if you look down the road 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I think we are, uh, we are lurching toward a significant problem, and I believe that bodies like the General Assembly should try to anticipate those multi-generational problems that we're going to have and not wait for them to become acute. Well, that resource plan does project for long-term and short-term. But I had a couple of questions on the bill, and we're looking at the Senate committee sub that ends in .02. Is that the most recent version? I, I believe that's correct. Okay. I don't have that. I'm having trouble keeping up with all the subs. So, all right. So um, I was wondering why you took out the words that I consider to be um, con protecting the consumer or the customers of the, of the owners. The, you took out the words unjust and unreasonable. Um, in that first section. I'm wondering why you took that out. Because to me, those are sort of like basic words that protect our constituents from things that are, that they sh really shouldn't be paying for. Uh, I, I certainly agree with that. I, I think that that was, that was viewed as as redundant there, but I'd have to go back and, and look at my notes. Uh, but certainly, uh, the 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 goal is to make sure that um, consumers are held harmless on this. So if if that adjustment has changed anything in, okay. in respect to that, we want to fix that. Okay, um, and then I, I'm trying to understand on uh, the second section, the new section 393.1250. Um, you talk about operated at 300 megawatts or less. The language that was in there before talked about operating at capacity factor exceeding 70 percent annually. Can you, can you share with us um, why we're kind of changing the, the threshold for the definition of a clean plant? Well, again, because it, we want to make it geared toward the small modular reactors and not the larger facilities. Okay, and your, your understanding was that language that was in there previously could have been applied to bigger sized reactors? I think that was the concern, yeah. Okay, all right, very good. And uh, I think I'm going to wait for some of the other witnesses to come forward, but I okay. appreciate the chance to ask you some questions. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Chair. Before we start, how many people want to testify in favor of this bill? How many in opposition? Okay. Um, let's go, uh, let's do the uh, proponents first. So first person testifying in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Ray McCarty, President of Associated Industries of Missouri, I'm going to go on record in support of the Senate Committee substitute. Um, Senator McCreary, we also had the same concerns you did about the original base bill. And so we've been working on this uh, both with the House and Senate sponsor. I have to say Senator Trent has been wonderful to work with on this. and. Uh, the result of our work is in that Senate committee substitute. Um, the original bill had a minimum of 200 megawatts for the project. Um, that is something that, rather than a maximum of 300 megawatts per project, that's something we changed because they said what they wanted to use this for were small modular reactors, not full-blown uh, plants. 
The House yesterday perfected language in Representative Black's bill that uh, does not include the 300 megawatt. It has a 600 megawatt uh, maximum. Uh, we believe the 300 megawatt is appropriate because that is the definition under the Nuclear Regulatory Commission of a small modular reactor. They're all rated at 300 megawatts or less. So we believe that's the appropriate number to use. The original bill also did not include any clawbacks. So very much like economic development programs that a lot of my members will use, if they don't live up to the expectations for whatever reason, COVID or whatever, um, they aren't entitled to the benefits and those benefits that they've been given to them are clawed back. So the Senate Committee substitute includes a clawback on page two and it allows recovery of whatever has been sent into rates with interest if the project is never built. That's something that will protect us from the same types of things you mentioned, Senator McCreary, in other states that have tried this and just taken quip away and uh, then they end up with billions of dollars that ratepayers have paid for something that's never built. So we think that's a very important component. And then the original bill also had renewables included. Um, if the, you know, solar and wind are not nearly as expensive to build as a small modular reactor may be. Um, so we understand using this in a limited way for small modular reactors, but not necessarily for the renewables. And so we ask for those to be removed and they are also removed in the Senate committee substitute. We believe that the bill in the Senate committee substitute protects ratepayers and also makes sure that we do protect what uh, Senator Trent mentioned is baseload, um, which Senator McCurry hadn't had to leave. Um, but she mentioned the, the uh, resource planning, something at, that happened at the beginning of last summer. Uh, we are part of MISO here, and MISO is the, is the interconnected grid of all the states. It includes Missouri, but it also includes other states that have gone really heavy in renewables. As a result, they don't have the baseload generation that they need. And MISO issued a statement at the beginning of this last summer to expect a shortage of electricity in MISO, and not because of what we're doing in Missouri, because we still have baseload here coming from coal and other sources, but because other states have gone so far in renewables, they've done away with their coal, they've done away with their baseload generation, and so they're depending on what's coming from Missouri to, up, to prop up the rest of the grid. So we're going to need additional baseload generation. Um, small modular reactor is a very promising technology. It's still, uh, as I understand it, uh, just now being built. Um, so we don't have a lot of experience with it, but it has a lot of promise. And so if we can do that here in the state of Missouri, we're supportive of it, but we want to make sure consumers are protected. We believe the Senate Committee substitute provides that protection. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you, Ray. Thank you. Next in favor, please come forward. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Doug Galloway. I'm here representing Ford Motor Company today. To speak in favor of the Senate Committee substitute for Senate Bill 333. I'd like to thank the sponsor for offering the Senate Committee substitute. Um, we support the legislation based on much what Ray had already talked about as far as the uh, restrictions to the uh, small uh, modular reactors. Uh, we think that's an appropriate thing to do as the coal plants are being replaced on a go forward basis. We do think the removal of the renewable energy is a positive thing as well because renewable does not really contribute to the base load as Ray mentioned. But most importantly, we do like the clawback provision that is uh, protecting the consumers if the plant does not become operational. Just like Ford Motor Company, when we receive some support from state governments across the country, if we don't fulfill our promises, then that support is clawed back to the government as well. And we think this would be an appropriate uh, action for this as well. So with that, I'll answer any questions or attempt to answer. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Doug. Next, speaking in favor. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Elizabeth Smith. I represent Missouri Public Utility Alliance. Uh, municipal utilities are in support of Senate Bill and the substitute uh, uh, 333. While this measure does not apply directly to municipal utilities, we do recognize the need for the construction of additional dispatchable power. We currently partner on electric generation projects with IOUs on the east and west side of Missouri, and we anticipate additional opportunities which serve to secure affordable, reliable power for our member cities. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for this witness? Thank you very much. Thank you. Please make sure you leave your witness form there.
Hi, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Fred Dryling today representing City Utilities of Springfield. We would like to go on record in support of the legislation as a not-for-profit hometown utility. We already have uh, the uh, ability to use QIP. However, um, unless an investor-owned utility, uh, you know, comes forward to do one of these projects, we don't see it happening in the future. So, therefore, we are in or want to be on record in support. But the, the quip doesn't apply to city utilities. So no, we can already do quip. So we can charge for something that's not online yet. But if if we don't have an investor-owned utility to partner with on one of these projects, right, right. we don't think it's going to happen, and that's okay. why we're in support. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you. Next in favor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Rebecca Eichelberger with the Electric Cooperatives. Um, I want to first say that the Electric Co-ops, we don't take a position on the PSC rate-making portions of the bill um, because our member elected boards of directors set our rates. Um, and it's a general rule for us to not uh, take a position on legislation that does not directly affect us. However, we do support and understand the basic policy uh, and intent of the bill of removing a possible impediment to nuclear energy in the state. Um, the entire electric industry, as you know, is being pushed towards a lower carbon or a no carbon future. And in doing that, reliability of baseload generation is one of our fundamental concerns. Current renewable options that we see are not capable of 24 hour long periods of dispatchable energy. Um, so, as going forward, the, um, we see of the base load, um, excuse me, uh, going forward, um, we see that only nuclear energy can offer um, dispatchable nuclear or dispatchable um, base load generation with no CO2 emissions. And for that, we support the bill. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Next in favor? First to oppose, please come forward. And again, state your name and leave the witness form if you would. Good morning. John Kaufman on behalf of the Consumers Council of Missouri, testifying in opposition to this bill, and I have my form here somewhere. Um, it's important to understand what this bill is about. It's about, it, this is about ch undermining the fundamental way that utility rates are set for these investor-owned utilities. And it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, this doesn't apply to the co-ops or the municipal utilities, but the way that the Public Service Commission regulates these for-profit uh, investor companies, the fundamental principle involved is that the investor makes the investment. They put their money at risk, and, and the, re the w reason that it works is that they don't get uh, return on that investment until they prove that the project is, is operational and cost efficient. And then at that point, they not only get their money from the ratepayers, but they get a profit, a very, very generous profit. It's not guaranteed, but it's virtually guaranteed, 9 to 10 percent profit. And so that, the, the, the part of this process that works so well, and has worked for about 100 years or more, is that it puts the utilities money uh, at risk. They have skin in the game. And our experience over many, many decades is that the utilities do so much better when it's their money at risk and their profit to gain rather than using someone else's money. What construction work in progress does is it forces the ratepayers to put the money up front. And uh, the experience that we've seen in Florida and in Georgia and in South Carolina when the, with these particularly large nuclear power pro projects is that the cost overruns are out of control, unlike what happened here in Missouri with the Callaway nuclear power plant. The Callaway nuclear power plant was finished after the voters uh, said quips, you know, quip does not apply. And it is one of the most cost efficient, safest, uh, best performing nuclear power plants in the country. And it was done, it was completed without quip. And so it's, uh, I think, important to understand that this is not an imp uh, necessarily an impediment to, to building a nuclear power plant. I like nuclear power plants. I think it's part of our future. The integrated resource plans show that, that we probably will start talking about nuclear power plants for our large utilities, uh, Evergy, Ameren, Missouri, and so forth, in about 10 years from now. This is a little bit premature to talk about that. 
I'm, a, I'm somewhat confused about why this legislation has been limited to um, small modular nukes. When I first heard about the, when the idea was first being pitched about 20 years ago, the idea was that, that instead of this huge investment having to be carried by the utility until they got to the rate case, you know, 10 years, 15 years, and so forth, instead they would be small, you know, it would be done in, you know, modular units. And the reason it was developed that way and engineered and, and was being promoted was it was a way that you didn't have to use QUIP. <laughs> So now here we're talking about SMRs, and, and yet the ratepayers were having to, having to put up the money. And what's particularly galling from a consumer advocate perspective is that these quip charges will include profit, unless, uh, I mean, it, the language could be adopted to just do the debt coverage, but the, you, the, not only are the ratepayers putting the money up front for a power plant that they may not even be around to enjoy later, but they also are paying profit to the utility for something that they have not proven yet. So. We just think that the incentives need to be aligned properly uh, it, and, and not undermine that, that cost incentive that's in the law, which is, is often described as the used and useful principle. In other words, your rates should only include uh, the cost for projects that are being used and are useful to serve you. Instead of, and I know that that, you know, the way the legislature, you know, often, uh, you know, will tax the public for projects in the future, this is a completely different system. And so this is why you'll hear people who are involved in public utility regulation uh, uh, bristling at this idea of quit because it's, it so undermines the consumer protections that are in place. I do appreciate the fact that this substitute, which I, I did have a chance to read, does include a clawback provision. I think it could be tightened up a little bit. I would also urge that if you're going forward with this bill that you do put back in the unjust and unreasonable language in there because I'm afraid that that would also be sort of a backdoor way to raise rates. And I would just remind you that, uh, that this is not necessary, it's not needed at this time, and that you have constituents right now, tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands in this state who are having trouble paying their monthly bills as it is. And it seems like every time this body passes another utility-related bill, the rates go up higher than they need to. Uh, the, the legislation that was passed in 2018 added a 10% increase onto the electric bills of investor-owned utilities. Uh, it's unclear how much this would add, but it would definitely raise rates higher than the, it needs to be. And so please think about those uh, folks of moderate income that are just trying to make it, just trying to, to pay the bills on the kitchen table every month, and uh, don't don't do this unless you feel it's absolutely necessary. Uh, and, and please um, urge you, if you, are, if you do go forward, to um, continue to work on, on the clawback and making sure the Public Service Commission has all the tools. I, I, would, I would suggest that uh, another, another clause that, that could be added that would help immensely is that, that the, the QUIP charges, construction work in progress charges be interim subject to refund. And that way, it would be clear that if a problem arises that the Public Service Commission is not banned. If it doesn't say those words, it could be, it could be deemed that the utility has a right to them whether they build the power plant or not. So th those are my technical comments, and um, uh, I'm able to answer any questions. Thank you. What, um, how many states ban QUIP, do you know? Um, at, the, the, uh, since half, half the states have deregulated the source of energy, uh, those states don't, don't deal with QUIP at all. But of the, the remaining you know, 25 states, I think there are three that ban QUIP okay. that in some way, either through the commission or through, uh, through, through a statute. Okay. And um, those, all those costs that you're talking about, that this, the, the commission would still be able to rule on the prudence of those costs. Is that not true? Uh, under this legislation, I believe right. so, yes. Okay. And uh, the, just, the, the, just the, for granted, do you know the cost of, of a kilowatt from a co-op to an IOU to a municipal? I, I, um, no, I, I couldn't tell you. It would be seven, eight cents. I, I don't know. But I, I, I don't know the differential between them. Okay, thank you. Ones. Questions for this witness? Nothing? Thank you very much. Next, in the opposition, please come forward. Would you sit there for just a minute? I'm going to really quickly go into executive session. That will give me a chance to hand it sure. out. Uh, well, actually, if you'd give those to Michelle, we'll hand them out here in a minute. Uh, I move that we um, that we go into ex executive session. Do I have a second? Hearing a second. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? We are in executive session. 
Uh, the first bill we're going to look at today is uh, Senate Bill 275. It's uh, a bill we heard a couple, three weeks ago from Senator Trent about um, the taxes on electric and gas equipment used for uh, generating power. Um, is there, first of all, I move that um, we do pass uh, Senate Bill 275. Do I have a second? So discussion on that. Does everybody remember the bill? Is there a substitute? There is not. It's just the original bill. This is the one that state and local. We're going to do the next one, which is the state next. It's for the utility itself. Senator Trent, if you'd like to explain that, you can. Yeah, so basically what you're doing is any any product uh, that's used in the generation of power, uh, so like a transformer or wire or any you know, anything that's going to be used uh, would not be subject to sales tax. And then, of course, the reduced costs from that pull forward into rates and lower rates for the consumer. Yeah, so do that, do, does that mean that, you know, is that going to help me when I'm buying plugs and stuff like that? Do I get no sales tax? Well, are you, <laughs> if, if you become a power generation company, then, then yes, I think it would apply evenly. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. Senator May, were your questions answered? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion on this bill? Okay, I've already made the uh, motion. We have a second. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if that's the case, Michelle, will you call the roll? Senator Sirpoy. Aye. Senator Fitzwater. Aye. Senator Bean. Aye. Senator Burnsgetter. Aye. Senator Brown. Aye. Senator Esslinger. Aye. Senator May. Aye. Senator McCreary. No. Senator Mosley. No. Senator Thompson Rader. Senator Trent. By your vote of nine to two, we have voted due pass Senate Bill 275. I now move that we bring Senate Bill 300 before the committee. Can I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Senate Bill 300 is before the, before the committee. Um, this is very similar to the previous bill. Uh, first of all, I move that we do pass Senate Bill 300. Do I have a second? Okay. Discussion on this bill. This is identical to Senator Trent. Is that true, except it doesn't have the local portion of it? That I didn't ask. How much, so since we're exempting uh, the sales tax on local and state, I forgot to ask this question, how much revenue is that going to bring out of the state budget the fiscal notes on the first bill said between six and 30 million dollars is that what it was I, I believe that was correct i was going to pull up the fiscal note real quick here so yeah it says lose 30 million dollars well it says from six to 35 million dollars depending on every year yes. well the years they spend yes when they're when they're building something yes and probably most years they build the same amount of equipment, replace the same amount of equipment. Oh, I should have voted no on that. <laughs> well, also keep in mind, uh, there's, there is a concern that, that it, may not be, it may not be legal to collect this tax anymore. And uh, if we don't address the situation, eventually we may catch a lawsuit that could uh, make that fiscal note 10 times larger than it is now because it would, it would uh, you know, potentially, if, if someone prevailed in court, they could, get, um, they could get a refund for 10 years. That's statute of limitations in this kind of case. And so it could cost the state 10 times as much as the fiscal note. Well, I, you never know, uh, but when that kind of money is at stake, uh, I think it's reasonable to think that a lawsuit could show up. How many years have we been collecting the tax? I don't know when the tax was first collected. I know that the um, General Assembly tried to address this issue, I believe, in 2014 and was unsuccessful. Uh, it was, it, it, uh, 
at that time, and this so this issue has kind of have, has has been around for so a while. So we've been now. collecting this tax for years. Yes, yes, we and have. And it been, has been no problem. Uh, no problem so far, uh, but there is uh, case law that has that has occurred in the last few years that would suggest there could be a problem. And so, what what state was that case law in? Uh, we're, we're doing this cold off in my memory here. I, I can get you that information. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions? Seeing none. Pardon me? You cannot. We've been told you can't change it. So uh, with that, Michelle, will you please call the vote? Senator Searpoy. Aye. Fitzwater. Aye. Bean. Aye. Bernsketter. Brown, Aye. Esslinger, May, no. McCreary, no. Mosley, Thompson Raider, Trent, by your vote of seven to three, we have voted do pass uh, Senate Bill 300. I now move that we leave executive session. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? We are out of executive session. Sorry for that delay. Please restate your name and, and go ahead and start your testimony. All right. Good morning, members of the committee. My name's Ed Smith. I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of Sierra Club. Uh, I didn't know until moments before the hearing that there was a substitute to the bill. However, our organization is still opposed. Um, I just want to paint a, a, a brief picture of the genesis of this, uh, it's been noted that this was not a utility, a, a monopoly utility led effort. Uh, this started with the Missouri Air Conservation Commission. Uh, there was a, a member that was is particularly fond of nuclear power, uh, convinced the commission to write a resolution uh, asking lawmakers to repeal Missouri's ban on quip. Um, the, on, the utilities were not in that venue either. The only entity to oppose that Air Conservation Commission resolution was Missouri Coalition for the Environment, where I worked, and the only proponent was the Missouri Farm Bureau, and then the Missouri Office of Public Counsel weighed in uh, with uh, a memo just detailing the, the current status of nuclear reactor uh, construction uh, throughout the country. Um, so again, it's worth reiterating, the bill, the utilities for which this bill are applicable have not been in favor of this for the last five or so years. Um, it's, it's my personal view that this, is, uh, this represents a tax. You're taking money away from constituents in a way that wouldn't happen without an act of the state legislature. Uh, this bill is going to increase inflation because it will allow a utility like Ameren, Evergy, or Liberty Empire to increase rates uh, by choosing a, a, an energy option that is more expensive than what is needed to meet demand for its customers. Um, no utility uh, for, well, that doesn't matter anymore because you all removed uh, renewable energy. Um, I also want to mention uh, as the, test like the testimony before me that utility customers are financially worse off now than they were before the pandemic. Uh, Ameren, Missouri disconnected 81,508 customers from service due to late payment in 2022, with over 20,000 of those disconnections happening in October alone. The 202, there's 202,000 Ameren customers who were behind on their, pay, on their bill as of December 2022, compared to 98,000 customers in December 2019 before the pandemic. That's currently one in six customers that Ameren has that are delinquent on their bills today. And those are meters, those are not people. So the number of people that are impacted by these late payments and utility disconnections is even greater. Now, this bill has been amended to focus legislation around the country, including South Carolina, Georgia, and uh, Florida. Um, though that, those promises of affordable nuclear reactors are not a reality. 
So I'm a little dubious about the Nuclear Energy Institute's similar rose-colored glasses for the timely and affordable production of electricity from small modular reactors. And the reason I'm dubious, I think, is uh, legitimate. Just recently, and I have it cited in my testimony that I submitted to you all, uh, the new scale small modular reactor nearly doubled in costs from 58 megawatt at $50 per megawatt hour to $89 per megawatt hour. Uh, this is a brand new design. Uh, I suspect, similar to Vodal, that there will be further construction delays and cost overruns. Uh, that is incredibly consistent with the nuclear industry's entire history in this country. Um, on page three of my testimony, you'll see that uh, Ameren's latest uh, significant IRP uh, integrated resource plan has uh, what it assumes are the cost of energy options as well as the levelized cost of energy from uh, Lazard. Um, wind and solar are currently more affordable um, than SMRs. That's why Ameren uh, and Evergy are prioritizing them in their integrated resource plans. Um, and the promise of SMRs, as alluded to by the, the, the fellow who testified before me, is that they're going to be built in a factory, probably not in Missouri, because some are currently under production in like Utah and Idaho. Uh, and so they'll be shipped to Missouri, uh, where the theory here is that they'll be able to be installed and turned on quickly. The whole point of construction work in progress is to decrease interest rates on multiple year projects. That is not the vision here being laid out by the industry. So why is QIP needed? Uh, it shouldn't be, frankly. Uh, if nuclear power, if small modular reactors become affordable and become a viable option for Ameren or Evergy, then they should have their shareholders put out the, the put, uh, be responsible for the financial risk currently uh, like they do when procuring new uh, resources or building transmission. Um, I do have a quibble, and I don't know what the line number is with the committee substitute, is that it says that under the definition of clean base load generating plant, it says that uh, utility, that, that the plant must be operational uh, fully or in part to customers in the state of Missouri. Well, why would it be that all of Ameren, Missouri's, and I'm just using that as a hypothetical because Ameren is the latest utility to want to build a nuclear reactor about 10 years ago. Um, why, why should Missouri, Ameren, Missouri ratepayers pay for the utility to ship those electrons to out-of-state uh, customers? It doesn't make sense to me. Um, touch on that. There were some folks who were proponents who touched on grid reliability, so I just want to touch on that a little bit, too. Uh, excuse the, me. Excuse me. We're not rebutting people. Just give your testimony. Okay? Sir, yes, sir. Um, the SMRs are not going to help with grid reliability. There's concerns about grid reliability now. Uh, that's often due to not because of increased renewable penetration on the grid, but because the existing fossils are not operating when they're most needed during winter storms. Uh, her, uh, Superstorm, or excuse me, winter storm Uri, the largest failure of the grid was due to gas-related infrastructure, not, not SMRs. And it's also worth noting that Callaway's nuclear reactor uh, was offline during winter storm Uri when it was most needed because of a technical problem that closed it down around Christmas and it didn't open for another seven or eight months. Um, so I'll just leave you with the cost of SMRs are going up. The uncertainty, there's so much uncertainty that I would encourage you all to allow future lawmakers to determine whether or not QUIP is appropriate when the utilities for which this bill are applicable at least express interest and there's more of an understanding about the economics of SMRs. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Proceed, sir. What's, the, what's your plan for baseload power needs if, if we're not doing nuclear, we're not doing coal, we're not, you're, you don't support any fossil fuel methods? Well, right now, MISO is working on uh, different tranches of transmission, which you may be familiar with. They just recently approved 
uh, a large transmission project in MISO North, which includes a small part of northeastern Missouri. Uh, they're considering other transmission projects to move renewable energy to, uh, to population centers where it's needed. Uh, frankly, transmission is the key to grid reliability right now. SMRs are a decade away, and they're not going to help right now. But for baseload power needs in the future, you think renewables are going to cut it for uh, the changes in our changes in our baseload power needs with coal plants going offline, um, not doing any new nuclear hardly across the country. How are we going to provide the baseload power needs? It's, it's my opinion that a combination of renewables, new transmission, demand response, efficiency, and distributed energy uh, can help meet that need. And let's have that debate, but this is about quip for SMRs that are not yet even commercially viable. I get it, but it's, a, it's also a, a debate about where you all stand on removing baseload power that we currently have to unreliable methods. And so again, that's, again, that's part of the broader debate on how we fight for our baseload power needs in the future. And it's, it may not be exactly on this bill, but it's just having the conversation. How do we go forward? How do we protect our, cons our consumers? How do we protect our, our grid? How do we protect uh, making sure that people can um, heat their homes in the winter? You can't do it with the renewables at times. You can't rely on that for the future. At I, this point, with where we're, where we're going, you can't rely on that in the future. And the, so that's where the concern is, is how do you, how do you replace baseload power needs? And you can't make the case right now that renewables is the answer for that in totality. And I'm so not that's making that argument, is. though. I didn't just make that argument. I said that renewables in combination with storage, which there's a project in Texas that just came online that's a, a, a base load storage project powered by solar, 200 megawatts. So we're talking about comparable to the size of SMRs that, uh, are, that this bill pertains to. And that came online this month, not 10 years from now. And so similar to the uh, cost decreases and increases in efficiency that we've seen in solar and wind, we're going to continue to see that in energy storage. There's some exciting storage projects out there, including in Minnesota, that's using the rust, like rusting iron to engage in long duration storage. Like the name of the game for renewables, right, is long duration storage. And in my opinion, we're in a better place to reach affordable long-term energy storage than we are to continue down the road of nuclear power. All right. Well, I certainly think innovation is a big part of it, but that would include SMRs. We've got to have a discussion on everything. How, how, do, we, how do we create an environment where everything is viable until it's not? And I think that's, I think that's really important. And thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator May. So why are you not for nuclear power? What is your opposition to nuclear power on the base level? Well, right now I think it is an economic equity issue. Uh, if you heard how many Ameren customers are currently behind on their bills, we already know that inflation is impacting low and fixed un income people. Uh, allowing a utility to have, until I learned there was a su committee substitute today, I thought this bill was a blank check for utilities. Um, I would, I'm not familiar with the consumer protection parts that were added to the substitute, so I can't speak to that. But I think that allowing Ameren to use Quip to pay for a SMR that should be an investment that its shareholders make could jeopardize uh, the uh, so you high, forward high bills. as long as they pay for it. Well, I'm speaking to this bill particularly. Uh, Sierra Club has issues like we don't. There are still some issues with long-term storage that have yet to be. Uh, addressed the federal government has not held up but its end of the bargain. You, you're okay with the base load with nuclear as long as they pay for it. No, ma'am. I'm I'm generally against it. I'm speaking to this and bill. And so you against it? Why? I'm trying to get to that point. I don't all that. I I think that we can power our country affordably without nuclear power using a combination of renewable energy. And so you think nuclear power is too expensive? It's too and expensive, and there are some unresolved issues with high-level nuclear waste that need to be taken incredibly serious, yet we continue to make more without handling that issue in a serious way. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions on the bill? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next in opposition, please come forward. 
Anybody for information purposes? For inf are you for information? Okay. And for the committee, I've, I've allowed this chart because I think it'll help us understand some stuff. So it's not just a prop, it's to help you kind of visualize what we're doing. <laughs> I can't either. Huh? No, just if it helps, just if it helps committee members understand things. Good afternoon. Good there's afternoon, no, Senators. There's no way I'm reading that. <laughs> <laughs> you just leave it up there. I can <laughs> proceed when you're ready. All right. Good afternoon, Senators. My name is Jeff Mark. I'm the Chief Economist with the Missouri Office of Public Council. Uh, we are a state agency. Uh, we, our agency represents consumers in cases before the Missouri Public Service Commission. Uh, water, electric, gas, uh, and even manufactured housing. Uh, my colleague here, uh, John Kleiser, is a senior attorney in our office, providing informational testimony today on the QUIP bill. Uh, like previous speakers, we just came across the Senate substitute, and I want to commend uh, Senator Trent for uh, the additions that were added. Uh, I think it goes a long way to uh, making a more well-rounded bill as drafted. I'm going to start off my discussion speaking about the pros, and then the cons, and then I'm going to specifically talk about QUIP, uh, and then my colleague will finish this up. Uh, in, in talking about nuclear, uh, I do want to stress uh, some of the pros that we are looking at here. This is a clean generation. Uh, we are in favor of fuel diversity. Uh, nuclear has historically been a long-term cost stability fuel. Uh, that is a bit in question moving forward in terms of uranium, and especially coming from Russia and the situation currently taking place. But historically, it has been um, a stable cost. The ability to, to dispatch when needed, so we call firm capacity, uh, nuclear provides that. It also provides uh, a number of jobs and increased tax base. It's also, I believe, necessary for a decarbonized grid. I don't think you get there without nuclear. Base load generation, um, these are all positives associated with nuclear, and it begs the question, why are we not wholeheartedly going and embracing nuclear? Uh, and this presents the challenges, and this graph illustrates this to a greater extent. Uh, today, to move forward with nuclear at scale, one needs to consider that um, th this graph here is from Professor Bent Flyberg from uh, Oxford University. He's the program management um, professor, uh, dean for Oxford University. Mr. Flyberg's uh, database consists of 16,000 mega projects over the course of 50 years. This is an enormous wealth of information. 16,000 projects, billions of dollars, 50 years. The breakdown, what you see here, is literally just looking at one issue. Construction costs and whether or not they came in on time, on budget, or not. For those not familiar with uh, statistical analysis here, we're going to talk about fat tails and thin tail distribution. In short, most people assume uh, a mean distribution across any, uh, any given database. Uh, the larger of a standard deviation that you have, that is, the larger it is away from the mean, the fatter the tail. The shorter it is, the thinner the tail. To translate that, a thin tail means that a project's going to come in on time or under budget. A fat tail, conversely, will go, can effectively be limitless in terms of its overall cost expenditures. You'll note from Mr. Flamberg's test from his graph here that solar and wind power are in terms of, of points that come in under budget um, and on time. And this is because they are effectively have mastered the, the ability to modular those units. They're small units. Think of it in terms of almost Legos that you can produce. Solar panels are very similar like that. You can mass produce it and put it out there. Those capital projects do come in on time. On the fat tail side, I would point your direction to nuclear storage the Olympics, and then nuclear power in terms of projects that have historically come in uh, at orders of magnitude above their cost. 
So what sort of danger are we talking about here? I mean, it's a potentially limitless downside in terms of overall cost from a historical perspective. Uh, those that can destroy projects, careers, or even blow up corporations. To move forward with nuclear in, in the United States, and this has also been the position of the U.S. Department of Energy, which I happen to agree with on this point, there would need to be three factors to happen. The first one would be a, a, a committed overbook of projects. You would need to go ahead and have somebody effectively put up skin in the game for 15 small modular reactors or more. The second thing that would have to happen is those projects would have to come in within 20% of their budget and on time. If it doesn't, you would scare away any future investors. The third thing would, has not, does not get nearly enough attention is the workforce scalability. Effectively, today, we do not have uh, an institutionalized project management knowledge for nuclear plant construction to inform future nuclear construction projects. We did decades ago. Those architects are effectively retired or have passed away. Building that up will take time. My biggest concern moving forward with, with QIP legislation, as it's presently drafted, uh, is that we would be part of that first mover, effectively putting our skin in the game to make sure that that would happen. This is the show me state, as I like to remind our commission and, and ratepayers across the state. Um, often I get, I open up with a lot of presentations in terms of speaking on a national stage by saying that we are the show me state, and as such, um, we're never accused of being first movers. It usually garners a chuckle from our, my friends from the east and west coast. I'm actually proud of that fact. I'm proud of the fact that I'm from Missouri, I represent Missouri ratepayers and that we can look at the mistakes and successes of other states and then move accordingly. I would urge the same sort of caution moving forward with QUIP. Again, I do believe nuclear is a necessary part of future modifications and future bill construction. I'm now going to move quickly specifically to the QUIP legislation uh, and Mr. Trent's language, which again does immense improvement from what it initially was. Um, and just signal the last uh, six bills that I'm aware of from states that have repelled QUIP. In South Carolina, the 2007 Baseload Review Act. This resulted in, and you can Wikipedia, this uh, nuke gate scandal. Uh, this was a $9 billion sunk cost, effectively, that built uh, a hole for, a for two nuclear power plants that was never built again. Uh, it never came to fruition. Effectively, they had to fill up that uh, hole. Uh, to quote Nuclear Regulatory Commissioner Gregory Zasbeck on the outcome, in quote, in the private sector you would never be able to justify this. In 2019, the, the, the utility in question went bankrupt and was bought for $7.9 billion. That's less than the actual cost of the nuclear project. In Florida, SB 888 in 2006 uh, repelled QUIP. This resulted, again, in two nuclear projects that were never built. Uh, in, in incidents, two incidents that exceeded $2.8 billion in overall cost. The Mississippi Rate Mitigation Reduction Act of 2008, again, another repelled QUIP Act that resulted in excess cost of $6 billion. The Georgia Nuclear Energy Financing Act, this is where, you, if you've heard about Vogel, the, the nuclear project currently in place in, in Georgia, uh, was estimated cost at $16 billion. That project now has exceeded $30 billion and is not operational. The hope for small modular reactor moving forward is out of the Utah Associated Municipal Power System. Uh, this is effectively a, a, a conglomerate of municipal utilities and cooperative utilities that have come together. The speaker before me alluded to this fact that those costs have increased exponentially. The initial cost for their small modular reactors was $4.2 billion. One year later, those costs are now $6.1 billion. There's also a very real fear that that project will never actually result in steel on the ground, as um, entities have effectively already are walking back on that. Um, New Scale has publicly said that they need at least an 80 percent subscription by 2025 before that they would need to move forward. The last thing I would focus on here is the opportunity cost that's necessary when we're considering this. I'm the chief economist, again, of the Missouri Office of Public Counsel. My job is paid, is really, I feel like my job is one where I'm being paid to be skeptical. 
to have a degree of, of skepticism in any sort of new shiny object that's moved forward. There's a risk and reward that's inherent in utility regulation. What I would emphasize is that that paradigm has shifted in the past 10 years. Look no further if you're an investor-owned utility consumer at your bill. You'll see an, an alphabet of acronyms that are listed there that increase the ability for utilities to cost recover uh, without due process in terms of regulatory oversight. Um, most recently, well, we've got the ResRAM, the MIA surcharge, the Environmental Cost Recovery Mechanism, property tax trackers, which was passed last year, uh, fuel adjustment clauses, various trackers, securitization as of last year. Uh, there is a very real world moving forward where your constituents' bills are going to be very large. And there's not a lot that we can do about that. Uh, I'd encourage that you keep consumer points and consumer um, clawbacks a as a top priority if you move forward with QUIP. Uh, Mr. Kleiser now is going to speak a little bit about AFUDC to provide some context for the investment challenges for utilities. I apologize, I'll keep this relatively short. John Kleiser, again, as I was already said, an attorney with the Office of Public Counsel. I wanted to very quickly just address a moment uh, the existing regulatory paradigm and how this legislation will actually change that. Construction work in progress, QUIP, the thing we're all talking about, allows a utility to capitalize a portion of the construction costs for a project before the project is actually put into service. That is currently not allowed. However, there is a system currently in place that allows for a portion of the financing costs that a utility incurs to be capitalized and included in the ultimate cost of the project. This is called Allowance for Funds Used During Construction, or AFUDC. AFUDC's purpose is to directly benefit existing utilities for the absence of QUIP. In other words, the current regulatory paradigm recognizes that there is no quip and compensates utilities for that fact. The reason I'm bringing this up is because if you repeal quip, I do not see a reason why there would be a ground shift change in how utilities would operate. They're already taking this into effect. The reason that you are not seeing nuclear power being built right now is not the lack of financing. It is the cost prohibitive nature of nuclear energy itself. I also want to point out to you at a very simple level that the existing change or changing, eliminating, allowing QUIP, I should say, sorry, eliminating the prohibition, allowing QUIP will have the possible detrimental effect of allowing utilities to need to work less diligently. To give you a very basic example, imagine you're a, a landowner with a considerable sized field. You need to hire someone to mow it. You have two options. You can either pay them each day for their mowing or you can pay them once at the end of the uh, entire thing once it's mowed. Which do you think is going to result in a most efficient and quick job? It's paying them once at the very end. That same object applies here. Under the existing paradigm, the utility is allowed to gain compensation for the financing that it has to incur during the construction, but only after the construction is finally completed, which means the utility has every incentive to complete the project quickly, diligently, and efficiently, while again receiving compensation for that forward fronting money. If you change that, the only difference is that you put more risk on ratepayers. Last thing I'd like to add, uh, you're probably familiar with the term sunk cost fallacy. That's probably perhaps one of the biggest concerns with repelling QUIP. Uh, if you're dropping billions of dollars even before you put construction, you know, plant into ground, uh, it becomes extremely difficult to walk back on that. The jobs. The, the sunk cost initially to get no return on that investment. Again, that sunk cost fallacy effectively bankrupt that South Carolina utility and it forced those, uh, uh, it forced consumers in that state. I think the, the average for um, the unbuilt construction in South Carolina resulted in a little over $7,500 per household, which they'll be paying off for the next generation. And that's for a unit that was never actually built. These are, these are effectively the concerns that we have. Thank you, and we're open for any questions that the committee has. Did, did the states you talked about 
when they repealed uh, or, or went to quip were they did they put a cap on it like this has got a 300 megawatt cap did they have caps on theirs or were they just open-ended effectively no okay and um, overall this I don't know if this is related to this bill or not but Callaway overall from the day it started till now is it a cost-efficient producer of electricity when you consider the whole life yes I, I would consider Callaway uh, uh, a cost-effective, efficient unit. Uh, I'd also, you know, just to point out, just for, for reference, that Callaway was largely built without the process of, of QUIP. Right. It was repelled during that process. So, um, But with all the overruns, all the everything, it's still, looking back now, it was a good investment for the ratepayers of the state? Yes. Okay. And I, I always read about cost overruns on nuclear. I mean, they're just historic. Is that mostly because the regulatory people always keep changing design plans and, and making modifications as they go? My question being, if small modular nuclear ever becomes cookie cutter, it'll be just a matter of all that should go away. And That's and the hope. I mean, my, and, and Senator Searpoint, what, what I would say is um, a proof of concept mm -hmm. would, would give me more confidence right. in actually seeing right now small modular, modular being the, the key word there, uh, is, is a misnomer. We, it doesn't exist yet okay. to the extent that we're able to if if you're able to produce or get buy-in from other states preferably right. that that could do this then by all means we'll be putting in forward um, small modular reactor as a viable option okay thank you senator bay so let me see if i can take my glasses off because i wrote a bunch of notes now i'm trying to find my question um you said something in the beginning when you had your chart up there, and it was in reference to solar and wind. So solar and wind is a ch cheaper, safer option, is what you're saying. It's a great question, Senator. Uh, solar and wind projects come in at cost or under cost. Uh, they're modular in nature uh, com relative to any other generation. If I may add on a little bit more to that, uh, the problem is that you can't have 100% solar and wind. That's what I was going to ask. Right. I was asking for the sustainability and the storage of that energy. Is it, it possible? It is a hypothetical that I don't believe could be achieved under today's w under today's resources. Mm -hmm. uh, you would have to overbuild that into such an extent. Uh, our office also doubles as an eminent domain, and I can tell you we would be getting a lot of phone calls uh, on, on that factor. Uh, but it's that, and that is the big concern, and that's that's been referenced before with with MISO and every and, and other units. Um, so fuel diversity is is a key. I would point out that there are many different types of generation that we consider. Uh, natural gas being one that I haven't heard mentioned uh, is, is also a potential option. Um, and the other factor that I would say that that gives me a little pause in terms of nuclear is is the time length that would be required to to build one of these stations. Again, ideally, small modular reactor would be quicker and less of a risk exposure, uh, but a typical nuclear reactor, easily 10 years. Right. A lot and can happen in 10 years. And so you say the small modular for nuclear does not exist yet? The, the concept certainly does. W whether or not it's actually been proven as a proof of concept where you've got examples of small modular, no. Mm. That's an opportunity. It is. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Uh, so building on Senator May's question about right now these um, SMRs are sort of conceptual. Um, what would we need to do to protect consumers in case something goes wrong, like you, you, know, you see an entire line of cars or you know, in the industrial uh, world, you know, things get recalled? Um, so how, what would protect our constituents from something like that, where it's built somewhere, it comes here, but then it's faulty? That's, that's a great question, Senator. Um, off the top of my head, the, the one thing that, that would, this probably is, isn't a limitless you know, uh, number of answers to this, but the one that, that immediately comes to mind uh, would probably require regulatory change. And t today in Missouri, what we utilize is what we call historical test year. So utility takes the risk. Utility management, and they get compensated for this, moves forward with projects and says, 
we're going to build X plant, and then we will come in front of the Missouri Public Service Commission after it's used and useful and ask for cost recovery for it. Uh, moving towards a quip-like world is really one where you're asking the commission for pre-approval. And you're asking them, and the example with the amendment that Mr. Uh, Senator Trent put forward was that uh, utilities would file a plan. Uh, and I appreciate that. I know from personal experience, a plan could be very, very brief. We're going to build a plant. It's going to go over here. We think you'll get it done now. Uh, that's all that bill effectively would apply. A pre-approval process, which does take place in some states, uh, requires the utility to go ahead and get that project management description out there. It need, would need to have deliverable timelines associated with that. And all of that, in my mind, would be necessary to ensure that things would be done under cost or within cost. Uh, again, I gave a 20% cushion in terms of over cost. Uh, but all of those factors would need to be considered uh, to ensure proper. I was just going to add that with regard to the plan, it is important to distinguish between a filing a plan and filing a commission approved plan or filing a plan for commission approval. The existing substitution just requires the plan to be filed. So, so would it be better, um, it would be better that it wasn't just a plan, that it was an something more official so that the PSC could weigh in? Very much so. I mean, the, the, the ability to actually, uh, effectively, what, what administrative law with PSC regulation, I mean, it, it is. It, it's administrative law, and you're, you're building a record. Uh, okay. So there's a degree of accountability that's associated with those filings uh, that I don't believe the utilities would need to be beholden to under the current drafted legislation or the and amended. Could you repeat what that was, plan versus? Uh, the language is variable, but you could use either file a plan a commission approved plan or file a plan for commission approval or anything that would require obviously the commission to actually approve the plan once filed okay right. very good um, another question I had um, you know I'm once one of the witnesses was talking about like this idea of like Lego approach to building these things when I look at this language I don't see anything that would protect consumers in, in that a, a utility could just have a campus where there were multiple units that were 300 megawatts or less. So, so this idea of protecting our constituents, many of who are really still struggling to pay their bills, this to me doesn't actually limit the risk for the consumer because there could just be a campus of, you know, seven of these, and then it then you've got the multiplier effect. So, do you see? Am I? missing something in here or could we could we work with a sponsor to like put some protections in all of that seems reasonable to me um so just to, to reiterate what i heard was the bill limits a 300 megawatt uh project but there's nothing preventing that utility from doing three 300 megawatt projects and effectively that would be a gigawatt of energy or the equivalent of what a nuclear power plant would be um Absolutely, language could be tightened okay. on that. I will tell you that, well, I'll let my attorney speak on whether or not that would be something that might be litigated at our end, but um, we'd probably need to think about that if you didn't have something like that and a utility attempted that. I, I can't actually, sorry, uh, speculate as to exactly how that would play <laughs> out. Well, and I might be, I don't be actually know. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out a way to protect Missouri. I don't want Missouri to become a Georgia Florida, South Carolina, Mississippi. And I think that's what we all are striving for, and we're just trying to figure out how to make it work. I, I, I do believe that if um, the first blush of this, uh, small modular reactors, I mean, if you can get 10, 15 proof of concept, I don't think you'll need QIP. I, I, I think this will take off. Like, it'll take off. Okay. And you'll have utilities and, and, and everybody else pushing forward for it. It's proving it and not falling in that fat tail distribution. That's, that's the big key. That's the big risk. And yeah. this ties back to your comments about us being the show me state. Like we don't want to be out there risking our, you know, playing fast and loose with our constituents utility yes, funds. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Senator uh, May. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I missed one question that I had. You said something about expecting consumer rates from electricity to increase. 
is that just because of where we're going in electricity or just based on this legislation? It would definitely increase with this legislation, but they're going to increase regardless of this legislation. Uh, there, there's a lot of factors involved in that. Uh, but yet yeah, our, our grid is fundamentally changing and uh, the level of scrutiny, I, I used to, I joke in my profession that um, there, I'm never bored, uh, you know, and it, it really is like drinking from a fire hose every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just use an example like cybersecurity. Uh, that is a potential, you know, uh, bottomless pit in terms of how much, how safe is safe, mm -hmm. right? How much do you throw at that? Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a speaker earlier uh, reference transmission lines that were coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Billions and billions and billions of dollars, plural, mm -hmm. in transmission investments going to be taking place. And that will fundamentally change all sorts of things, including the valuation of any given plant. So in that case, all of these factors that are going to increase consumers how do we, you know, keep those costs low? That's a great question. And I wish I had a uh, like half hour to go ahead and, and, and expound on that. Um, I think it's important. Uh, I tell you from our office of eight people that represent, you know, consumer advocates, um, you know, that's, that is our priority is to keep those rates low. Uh, but, you know, giving the, you know, the commission, um, Making sure, well, let me take a we'll step back a second. One of the bigger problems that you're facing right now uh, is just a brain drain taking place across all of our departments. And that's true not just in our office, but in the Missouri Public Service Commission. Trying to find and attract talented individuals that can go ahead and have an objective opinion on issues on this uh, and the volume of issues that we deal with uh, is tough. I mean, we're, we are we are swimming, you know, but it is, it is against a lot of current and a lot of issues in a very dynamic world that's taking place. So, um, you know, good funding with that would be one recommendation. Uh, the ability of, of just not minimizing the commission's power uh, would, would also be critically important. Uh, you know, the commission's invested with providing um, an objective economic regulatory perspective on issues. Uh, to the extent <clears throat> that they're allowed to do that, uh, in theory, should provide a good proxy for what would happen in the market. Very good. We just need Benjamin Franklin back here. <laughs> Thank you. Any other you. questions for this? Thank you. John, would you go to my office and make an appointment? I'd like to talk to you about some of the stuff you've said, okay? okay. Uh, thank you. Anybody else speaking for information purposes only? Thank you for your time. Senator Trent, do you have any closing comments? Oh, hang on. I think there's somebody coming up. I don't see. Are you speaking for in information purposes? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Sorry, Senator Kay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Ronnie C. A. C. Dinoff, State Public Advocate. And um, there's a lot of moving parts with this bill. Um, there's a lot of parts in the legislature this year. And I really want to testify for informational purposes that this committee and the House and the Senate as a whole need to watch the lobbyists because they're buying power and influence and I'm asking you to be very cautious. You're here for Missourians, not here for special interests. And special interests are getting greedy and they want more profits each and every year. Um, as I said, there's a lot of bills that are moving through the legislature. They always seem to be favoring utilities and trample upon Missouri consumers. There are too many areas that hide money and get more profits in terms of upfronting the uh, cost of construction. Ari, it sounds to me like you oppose this bill and we've already closed off the opposition. I mean, if you were neutral, I don't think you'd be saying what you're saying. So I don't think it's honest to say you're here for information purposes. I, I'm, I'm testifying for informational purposes. But they're pretty negative in, informational purposes. So Missouri consumers need to be first and um, foremost in these proceedings and any other bills that we come uh, before the Senate committee. Okay. That's my testimony. Okay, thank you. Any thank questions? You. Seeing none, thank you. Senator Trent, anything, closing comments?
Senator Serpo is going to present three uh, Senate Bill 374. Go ahead whenever you're ready, Senator. Thank you. Hopefully this will be a quicker bill. People are leaving, so it probably will be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get that a lot, so I'm, I'm used to it. Members of the committee, I'm Senator Serpoy from the 8th District, Jackson County. I'm here to present Senate Bill 374. When voters passed the renewal, Renewable Energy Standard in 2008, large commercial and industrial customers were not voluntarily buying renewables to meet their company's clean energy goals. Today is very different where hundreds of companies ranging from banks to large manufacturers and infrastructure companies have clean and renewable energy goals. They are voluntarily buying a large amounts of renewable energy to meet those goals. The problem this bill is, is uh, recommended to fix is if a state has a renewable energy standard that doesn't allow for utilities or the state to factor in a company's voluntary renewable purchases to support their own operations, it leads to a situation where the ut utilities are over-purchasing renewables for the renewable energy standard, which means customers are paying more than they need to for the utility to comply with the renewable energy standards. Senate Bill 374 is a technical change to the renewable energy standards that allows a state to factor in the voluntary large-scale renewable energy purchases made by commercial and industrial customers. So the utility doesn't have to purchase renewables to cover the customer's load twice with renewables. These large customers that buy renewables on their own are still paying for all the important things that keep Missouri's grid reliable and stable. An additional benefit for average customers is the fact that the additional load required for these customers won't increase the renewable requirements that are part of the renewable energy standard, saving customers millions of dollars. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I think there'll be some witnesses coming up that can get into the details. Any questions for the senator? Seeing none, anybody testify in favor, please come forward. Good morning, committee. Uh, Jason Clint testifying on behalf of Evergy. And just as a reminder, Evergy is the IOU that serves the western half of Missouri and most of Kansas. So we're headquartered in Kansas City, but we are the IOU that serves that side of the state. So I want to thank the chairman for this bill. We're in support of it, but we've worked to create a market tariff. So that was actually done over at the PSC. There's a tariff that has been created where a large customer can come in and, and do this. So I. What I, the reason I tell you that is I want you to understand you're not necessarily authorizing it. It's already been authorized by tariff. This bill is in support of that tariff. But this is meant for customers of over 100 megawatts. So just for context, our next largest customer is 75 megawatts. So when we say 100 megawatts, this is a very large customer that's running usually 24-7 a data center, but it could be other things. In its simplest terms, the bill just does two things. The customer is building renewable assets and putting that power into the Southwest Power Pool. The customer then pays us for the market price of that energy uh, to serve them, and they bear the risk of, a, of that price going up and down. So they're, they're not using the same electrons, but they are putting in the same amount of power into the Southwest Power Pool at a specific price, and then we charge them that same price. This allows them, it's an attribute that they want to be able to say that they are 100% renewable. A customer size this large, it makes more sense for them to do it than it does for us to try and go out and, and, find, and, and find that power and bring it in for customers and for others. They're still paying for the wires, the poles. Really all this is, is this is the fuel charge goes up and down and they're the ones that bear the risk of it going higher or getting the reward of it going lower. So that is, those are the, the two things that places the burden on them. Uh, the other, the way that this affects Evergy is as the customer's load increases, the utilities need to cover that for the stand, uh, for the state mandated RES would also go up. So what this bill does is this, this bill exempts that load from counting toward the RES. We've already met our, we're already in RES compliance. We're 50% non-carbon. Uh, renewable energy standard is the RES is what that's known as. I was just told through my earpiece. Um, and so that's, so that's all this bill does. It is simply exempting them from paying twice for renewables and it's exempting us from counting uh, the extra renewables that they're already providing to the system toward the RES. Thank you, any Clearly. questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Yep, you're all right. 
Okay. Anybody else testify in favor? Please come forward. Most of what I intended to say has been covered by the sponsor and by Jason, but um, I represent uh, Meta Platforms, former. Can you tell Meta. us who you are? Amy Blunt, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, represent uh, Meta Platforms. You may know them as Facebook and Instagram. They would be considered an accelerated renewable purchaser under this bill. And the tariff that was spoken of earlier was an important part of our siting decision to make the investment that we've made in the data center in the Kansas City area. Um, essentially, Facebook has a, a goal to be 100% sustainable, and they're purchasing large amounts of renewable energy on, uh, you know, in the open market and contributing that to the pool, and this would prevent us from paying for that renewable energy twice. There are other states that have similar programs in place, um, Washington State, Virginia, New Mexico, Illinois, and those, these sorts of provisions make this diverse territory attractive to data centers like the one that's being built in Kansas City. And I'll take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Philip Arnzen with the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and we'd like to go on record in support. Uh, we believe this would be a good economic development tool, especially for large projects um, to come to the state and uh, <clears throat> create things like data centers or any other large project that would use uh, vast amounts of electricity. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Good morning. Uh, my name is Philip Frasica. I'm here with Renew Missouri. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organized to promote renewable energy and energy efficiency policy across the state. I wish to testify in support of Senate Bill 374 today. While we support the bill, we would urge this body to expand the language so the concept in the current text can apply to more businesses in other parts of the state. As you just heard, there's a real uh, need from businesses across the state that have corporate uh, goals, corporate requirements for them to hit renewable energy targets. Uh, having access to renewable energy credits and access to renewable energy generation could allow more jobs to come to the state. While this is really focused on the western side of the state today, uh, there are examples already in Missouri of uh, projects being done for corporate customers. Uh, currently, there's a pending decision to build a solar array for several Ameren corporate customers, including Walmart. Uh, many of these corporate customers are on record saying that they will relocate pending projects if the solar array is not approved. So this is changing decisions for jobs, economic opportunities for the state of Missouri. So I'd really encourage the passage of this bill and expanding it and amending it to allow more utilities to offer this to customers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Senator McCurry, go ahead. Uh, good morning. So I'm looking at the bill. Um, I, I think what you're getting at is when we define accelerated renewable buyer um, that we might want to, a way to have it benefit other businesses in the state would be to make sure that it includes folks that um, would have an aggregate load, you know, less than 10 megawatts. Yeah, I think something like that could help okay. uh, to alleviate this. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Anybody else testify in favor? Anybody against? Please come forward. Anybody for informational purposes? Uh, I was against. Uh, my name is Arnie C. A. C. Dino, State Public Advocate. Um, I'm against Senate Bill 374. The committee really needs to read between the lines. And I believe, again, this is all for the utility companies and very little to none for the Missouri consumer. Um, there's a lot of buying of power in the state legislature this year for from um, utility companies. And um, this tariff just leaves a lot of open-ended areas. Um, I ask that you leave the rate system the same and leave it under the um, public hearing process with the Public Service Commission. It's fair, ample, and concise, and fair for Missouri consumers, and therefore I'm opposed to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Anybody else for informational purposes only? 
Seeing none, that concludes the hearing. Do you have any closing comments, Senator? Uh, no, Senator. Let's just let's trade places. Okay. Last bill today will be Senate Bill 395. Uh, Senator Burns, together, proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Like the chairman said, my name is Mike Burns, Kidder, representing the 6th District. I have Senate Bill 395. Um, it extends the fees for certain natural resource programs to the year 3034. Uh, the programs include fees for hazardous waste, radioactive waste, safe water, or scrap tire disposal. Um, we do not want the federal government intervening in our program, so extending the measures hopefully will keep from those those things from happening. And I'd be happy to answer any general questions, but if you had specific questions, um, somebody from the department is here to testify. Thank you very much. Any questions for Senator Burnsketter? Seeing none. Thank you. First person in favor, please come forward, leave your witness for him, and tell us who you are. Thank you, Chair Searpoy and members of the committee. My name is TJ Graven. I'm with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources here to testify in support of Senate Bill 395. Um, as Senator Burnsgetter said, uh, this bill extends sunset dates on a number of fees that go to support programs that the Department of Natural Resources operates. Uh, these programs are important because they help ensure responsible use of the state's natural resources and maintain the state's delegation of federal authority, and they do that in lieu of using general revenue. Um, there are no increases in this bill. Um, four areas in which uh, the fee structures or the levels of fees are determined by a commission. Um, that process involves stakeholder engagement. It's similar to a rulemaking process, includes stakeholder engagement, public comment, and legislative oversight. We have some people here today who can speak to their perspective on that process. But I thank you, Senator Burnsgetter, for presenting the bill. Thank you for hearing the bill, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next, in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Ray McCarty, again, Associated Industries in Missouri, want to go on record and supported this. And we did have one minor change, uh, some language that's very important to us that we furnished to the Senator's office. I believe the Department of Natural Resources has also agreed to. And what this does is just ensure that not only are we extending the fees and making sure that they don't revert, if they ever do expire, they don't revert to where they were a decade ago, uh, but also making sure that the Department of Natural Resources does not rely on guidance documents when they're imposing a penalty or some kind of punitive measure on a regulated entity. Um, this is something the current administration is not doing. They are not doing this. But we want to make sure that no future administration does, and that would give us great comfort knowing that the only checkpoint you really have is when these fees come up for renewal. Um, but the stakeholder process works very well. Uh, we're very happy that they, they've been very open and honest with the stakeholder process, and we found it to be a very good way to vet those fee increases so that when they happen, we all agree at what level they should be and who they should apply to. Happy to answer your questions. Thanks, Ray. Any questions for this witness? Senator McCray. Could you clarify what you mean about a future, like a possible scenario where a future administration would do something? So there's... Uh, and this is something that should concern everyone who's a legislator. It certainly concerns our congressmen and women. Um, the guidance documents are like a memorandum that comes from a bureaucratic agency. They don't really have the public input like we have today with this hearing, um, or uh, they don't have the same vetting as a regulation would have, where you have public comment periods and review potentially by the uh, legislative elected leaders. And so those guidance documents are fine for advisory purposes, and in some cases they are very helpful. But in other cases, if you're trying to do something that you just can't do by regulation mm -hmm. or law change, they can be dangerous. And so we're just saying don't rely on those. If there's someone that you're getting ready to use that against that disagrees with that, then they would not be able to use that. Uh, but otherwise they could. So there are areas like, you know, that amplify the statute and amplify regulations that we believe are fine. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Next, in favor of the bill. I 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Elizabeth Smith, Missouri Public Utility Alliance. Municipal utilities are in support of Senate Bill 395 to ensure adequate and consistent support of DNR operations and assistance programming. Municipalities frequently work with DNR on air and water quality compliance issues. For budget and planning purposes, it is critical to be able to anticipate fee schedules as well as consistency and regulatory oversight and programming. I'll take Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank, thank you very you. much. Next in favor? Hi, my name is Annika Cariaga. I'm a professional engineer in civil engineering. I graduated from the University of Missouri Rolla, now Missouri S&T in 98. Worked at Midwest Environmental Consultants for over 20 years. I'm the vice president of the Missouri Society of Professional Engineers and the chair of our government relations committee. MSPE worked with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, MDNR, in crafting this bill language and on sponsorship of the bill. We appreciate Senator Burns Getter for sponsoring this important legislation concerning MDNR funding, and Representative Bob Brumley, a fellow engineer, for sponsoring a similar bill on the House side, House Bill 779. The only difference between the House and the Senate versions are the sunsets extensions are for six years on the House side versus 10 years in this bill. And the House one already has the AIM amendment uh, bill language that uh, Ray spoke about that was written in conjunction with MDNR. This bill extends sunset dates for existing funding sources that maintains many of MDNR's programs. The bill does not raise any fees or make any changes to MDNR's authority. These funds are used to ensure that the state maintains its delegated authority from EPA to administer federal environmental laws. However, if the sun sets granting the, the Water, Air, and Hazardous Waste Commission's authority to revise fee structures expires in August of 2024, all fees that were previously revised by these commissions will revert back to statutory levels of 2000 to 2004. According to the fiscal note for this bill, DNR would lose $18.5 million per year starting in 2025. It increases to $24.7 million by 2027 once all the other fees have expired. Current regulations state any fee bond or assessment structure established pursuant to the process in this section shall expire on August 28, 2024. We are proposing to remove that language and replace it with the following. If the commission's authority to revise the fee structure as provided by this subsection expires, the fee structure in place at the time of the ex expiration shall remain in place. No business or agency in today's economy could survive if their funding reverted back to levels from over 20 years ago. If DNR does not have adequate funding to operate these delegated authority programs, there is a significant risk that the state could lose that delegation from the federal government. That means that the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, would administer federal environmental laws instead of the department. The delegated authority programs in this bill are air, hazardous waste, and water, which includes drinking water, wastewater, and water pollution. In my line of work, when I ask a fellow engineer or client, who would you prefer to work with, DNR or EPA, the overwhelming response is always DNR. We would much rather work with fellow Missourians to solve our environmental issues versus EPA. If EPA takes over control of Missouri's air, water, and hazardous waste, Missourians will have no recourse besides the court system. Our governor and legislature will no longer have any authority. As mentioned before, some of the fees in the bills are statutory, and some are set by commissions through a prescribed process that includes a significant stakeholder engagement and legislative oversight. Stakeholders appreciate the opportunity to provide input on this process and prefer working with state agencies opposed, op opposed to federal agencies. However, the legislature has the authority to disapprove any fee change made by a commission, which it recently did in 2020 for a hazardous waste stakeholder proposed fee. My company, Midwest Environmental Consultants, and our clients are active participants in the stakeholder process. A good example in Missouri is utility companies are currently working with DNR to develop a coal combustion residual CCR permitting program. 
EPA issued the CCR rule in 2015. However, instead of a permitting process through EPA, utility companies are required to post their reports online that are stamped by a professional engineer and wait to get sued by environmental groups or citizens. I am one of the engineers with my stamp on those reports. The utility companies in Missouri lobbied for Missouri Senate Bill 917, which was signed into law in 2018. The bill granted DNR the authority to promulgate rules for the management, closure, and post-closure of CCR units. The stakeholders are willing to pay voluntary fees in return for the services provided by having MDR permitting program in place. Stakeholders pay these fees instead of asking the general public to fund these programs through their taxes. We would prefer to work with a fully funded MDNR rather than EPA. With the potential loss of almost $25 million for funding for DNR and the threat of losing Missouri's delegated authority from EPA, it is very important to get this bill to the governor's desk before the sunsets expire. The Missouri Society of Professional Engineers supports this bill. Thank you for your time and consideration of this important bill. Thank you. Questions, Ms. Witness? Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Next in favor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Mark Rhodes. I'm here representing the American Council of Engineering Companies of Missouri. Uh, we'd like to go on record in, in support of this bill. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none. Next in favor? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Trent Watson here on behalf of, I got two for, for you, uh, the Missouri Limestone Producers Association, the Missouri Rural Water Association. We'd like to go on record in support. We would also like to see the change to add the language that uh, Mr. McCarty referred to. Um, other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Thanks, Trent. Next, in favor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Kevin Perry. I'm the assistant director at REGFORM. REGFORM is an acronym. It stands for the Regulatory Environmental Group for Missouri. We are an association of businesses in uh, uh, institutions around the state, all of whom must comply with environmental regulations. We're here to speak in support of this bill today for all of the reasons that have been mentioned by the previous folks giving testimony. But uh, I can tell you among my constituents, uh, we, we rarely uh, have a, a universal block unanimous view on, on this one issue of doing what we can to keep these uh, federally delegated programs in the state not going back to EPA. Uh, it requires that we have adequate funding to do that. And um, this bill that's before you doesn't raise any fees. It just extends the authority that's currently given to the commission. It's a system that has worked very effectively for over 10 years, and we support it. So thanks for um, hearing my testimony today. Thank Happy you. To answer any questions. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, it's always Thank better you. not to go first. It's everybody else says things. Next, in favor, please come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Aaron Baker here to represent Continental Cement, uh, one of Northeast Missouri's largest employers. Last year, uh, Continental had some issues on site and uh, DNR worked with the company to work through permits and other issues. And it was much more pleasurable to do that with DNR than the EPA and, and Continental is here to support Senator Burnsketter's efforts and appreciate what AIM is doing to improve the bill as well. Thank you. Questions for Aaron? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Next in favor? This may be the best, most favorite bill of the day. <laughs> I know. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Kaina Iman. I'm glad several of you stuck around to hear my stellar testimony in support of Senator Bernsketter's bill. On behalf of the Nature Conservancy and Metropolitan St. Louis Sewer District, we do support the bill. Thank you. Questions for Kaina? Seeing none. Thank you. I won't even sit down, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Fred Riling today representing city utilities would like to go on record in support of the bill. Thank you. Any questions for Fred? And those in favor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, state public advocate, and I support Senate Bill 395. Um, extending the fees to 3034 um, I want to go on record um, and make sure that the committee 
um, insist that we recoup the actual fees. We recoup actual cost of all inspections, 100%, and all um, money to run the programs. Um, I feel that that's really necessary uh, that we're recouping the actual fees. Um, also, I want to make sure this bill has no new fees in this bill. I've heard testimony saying that there is none, so I take it at their word. And the third issue is there's another uh, piece of legislation that creates a new fee for a newly found mineral that may be found in Missouri. And I want to make sure that that does not happen either. So they should be charged the same tonnage rate of other minerals, and we shouldn't recreate another line item for a new mineral. That's my testimony, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Anybody else in favor? Anybody in opposition? For information purposes? Senator Bernskater, would you like to close? That will conclude the hearing today uh, for Commerce, Consumer Protection, Energy, and the Environment. We are adjourned.